I'm Denise Howell, and you're about to join us for This Week in Law. My co-host, Stefan Schweida, is here. We're going to take a brief trip to the EU, where its highest court was asked to wake up and taste the cheese and decide whether the cheese taste could be copyrighted. Also in the EU, its proposed copyright directive could be financially unfeasible even for YouTube. We'll talk a lot about disclosure and disclosures on this episode. As in, is that a real metal band or are your bots just happy to see me? We'll talk about CGI influencers and whether an algorithm should be deciding who's eligible for bail. All this and more next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love from people you trust. This is TWIT. This is TWIL, This Week in Law with Denise Howell, Stefan Schweida, and Matt Curtis. Episode 443, recorded November 16th, 2018. Popularity Ponzi Schemes. This episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by Slide Belts by Brig Taylor, high quality, comfortable ratchet belts that are easy to adjust. If you want a better belt, go to slidebelts.com slash twit and use code twit for 20% off. Hello, hello, I'm Denise Howell and you're joining us for This Week in Law. We're so excited to be here uh, on this last show before our Thanksgiving holiday break, or as Stefan is prone to calling it, American Thanksgiving holiday break. My co-host Stefan Schweida is here with me today. Hi, Stefan. Hi, Denise. Just the two of us here today. Uh, so I will do my best to keep my answer short at the risk of monopolizing the show. Oh, no, not at all. Please ramble on. <laughs> <laughs> definitely uh, grateful that you're here and grateful for the support. Grateful that you're all here with us this week because there's been some uh, interesting stuff going on, as there inevitably is at the intersection of technology and the law and the policy of technology law. So we're gonna jump right into it with some stories first off today that relate to copyright. It occurs to me watching that bumper that there that we've been doing the show long enough that I think that when we started the show, and that bumper was created, uh, people would have been far more likely to know what a VCR is than and, and its significance to copyright law than they are today. <laughs> so uh, for anyone who is wondering what that random machine in our uh, copyright bumper is, it is a video cassette recorder and uh, some seminal copyright law in the United States, Sony versus Universal uh, involved the VCR and the ability of people to, it's a seminal fair use decision from the US Supreme Court, involved the ability to, of people to uh, make recordings of uh, presumably television programming uh, with their video cassette recorders, which they had eagerly connected up to their sets so that they could record things and watch on their own time and also skip commercials. So that was really the first technology that let us do that. My uh, copyright history moment of the day. All right, let's let's uh, let's go on to uh, copyright's future. Uh, one thing that may be in copyright's future uh, and looks strongly like it will be in copyright's future is uh, a very, concerning law in the EU, concerning and controversial. Uh, one person who seems to be quite concerned with this law is uh, Susan, now I'm never quite sure how to say her name, her last name, whoa, I'm gonna try one more time, uh, whoa, Jiki? You know, sure. it, it so happens, Denise, I know how to say it. How to say it? <laughs> it's Wojcicki. <laughs> so I'm so glad you know how to say this. One more time. Wojcicki. Wojcicki. Uh, thank no. you, Mr. Schweider. <laughs> yeah. Um So YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki uh, is one of the uh, many people who have spoken out about uh, this new proposed copyright directive 
from the EU. There are a couple of parts of it that are um, noteworthy and controversial. Uh, one that is is less concerning to YouTube C- CEO is known as the link tax. Um, and this would only allow quote unquote commercial links uh, from news sites to um, link to stories if you have negotiated something with the story that you're linking to and you're p- paying royalties. So something like Google News, for example, would um, have a real difficult time doing what it's doing without negotiating um, royalties with the news sources. Uh, the news sources, I think, I would think under this would have a heck of a harder time to get uh, surfaced and disseminated uh, because they're not going to come up in relevant search results. And uh, Corey Doctorow has a really nice piece at Medium uh, talking about uh, both this piece, the link tax, uh, which is Article 11 of the proposed new directive, and the piece that YouTube CEO is concerned with, which is Article 13, which makes platforms responsible uh, for any copyrighted material on the platform that is posted without permission of the rights holder. Uh, which is something that uh, YouTube has obviously struggled with for years with content ID, et cetera, et cetera, and still, you know, has not perfected the abil- ability to uh, make sure that YouTube is a an infringement-free environment. Um, Corey's point in his Medium post, he he has several points, uh, and he has a good update as to um, what we can expect from this, other countries, um, the support for this in the EU and how it has dwindled and how uh, there may be sufficient concern over these uh, portions of the directive that it ultimately gets blocked. Uh, but for now it is it is chugging ahead. Uh, but the, the point that I think is really compelling that Corey makes is that um, to the extent that there is anyone who can deal with the responsibilities that this directive would put on businesses. It is the large tech companies of the world. It's the Google and the Facebooks and the Twitters. And if you have a smaller search engine or a smaller video platform or whoever else may be impacted by these concerns, uh, you are not going to have anywhere near the resources to be able to comply. And here, uh, uh, Susan, one more time, Stefan. Wojcicki. Wojcicki uh, is uh, is saying, hey, not even YouTube can deal with this. Um, she points out that there are 400 hours of video uploaded every minute to YouTube. And uh, she gave an hour, uh, she gave an example, sorry, of uh, Despacito, which is the most watched video on YouTube um, and walked through uh, the how difficult it would be to police every single potentially infringing upload that incorporates some portion of Despacito. Uh, Another really interesting thing I thought um, between these two pieces, one is at The Verge uh, by Julia Alexander and the other is Cory Doctorow's Medium piece, is just the extent of investment that has gone into content ID over the years. Um, the Verge reports that YouTube has invested over a hundred million dollars in that technology, and no one thinks it's perfect, even after all that. Um, so, uh, just an update on uh, this law in the EU that continues to be a concern. It's not yet in effect, but if it goes into effect, it is going to definitely change the copyright landscape in much the way the GDPR has changed the privacy landscape. Um, and and perhaps uh, advantaging larger players, but maybe even the larger players won't be able to cope with these kinds of requirements. What do you think about all this, Stefan? When you see a law like this, sometimes the impulse, as we talked about, I think it was last week or the week before, is to question whether the people who wrote it thought about the unintended consequences. And in this particular case, this law would have such a devastating impact on the ability to share content online that I almost wonder if that's the right analysis because it sounds like the intended consequences to stop that behavior. And so I I would wonder, you know, why are they doing that? Who's behind this legislation and and what are their goals? I I don't know enough about the internal uh, workings of of the EU legislative process. I don't know if 
the legislators themselves sit down and write this stuff or whether it's done in connection with lobbying groups who have some sort of stake in the process and they want to propose legislation that they think will advance their agendas. I'm not sure whose agenda is advanced by this, and I'm, I'm not really sure um, how this came about, but I, I can't imagine that anybody reading this uh, is naive about the consequences that it'll have. And so they must want this result. And, and I just wonder why that is. It, it doesn't it doesn't seem to have any way of being reconciled with the current online platform uh, platforms that we're used to and the kind of behaviors that we're used to seeing online. So it seems to be a frontal assault on that. And I, I just wonder why they're doing it. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, it would be interesting to know, you know, what sort of money or influence is involved in making this come about. And I'm, I'm wondering if what may wind up being the outcome here, and again, I'm just speculating here, like you, I'm not familiar with um, the how the sausage gets made there in the EU as far as finalizing this kind of a directive. But it seems to me like some sort of accommodation um, to wanting an EU specific copyright directive would be to adopt something like what we have here in the United States in the form of the DMCA that YouTube and others are already pretty experienced in complying with at this point and have dumped hundred, you know, in YouTube's case, a hundred million dollars investment into its compliance uh, mechanisms around that. Um, so I'm wondering if if the unintended consequence of having this out there may wind up in the form of compromise, uh, some sort of exportation of the DMCA instead. Uh, I don't know, but it seems like that could be a system that that could be an alternative to to what um, YouTube CEO here is calling f completely financially impossible. Um, do you think I'm off base? I I do wonder if this is going to be the final version, and it, it would make sense for them to try to look to other examples. Maybe as, as low as the DMCA is in some communities, uh, it seems better than than, than what this is uh, proposing mm -hmm. here. So it would make sense for them to look to existing laws and try to borrow some of the concepts from there. Uh, again, I, I, a little bit outside my wheelhouse, I don't know exactly what the legislative process is like in, in the EU and whether they have this sort of pluralistic, let's consult other sources attitude or whether it's more... Uh, we're going to take an option and just plow it forward uh, regardless of consequences. Um, if this passes, what, what I would imagine happening is uh, there's some period of time during which people accrue unsustainable penalties and start pulling out of the, the market, uh, and then the EU decides to amend it. Uh, and, and then it'll just be a war of attrition and see how much people are willing to sacrifice in order to keep something like this in place. Either that or it'll just be amended out of existence pretty quickly. Uh, I, I just can't can't see a path forward for the kind of behavior that we have online now through this framework. And I, I can't imagine they're going to want to keep that going for very long. Yeah, we've already, in the case of the GDPR, seen companies who blocked EU traffic as they attempt to grapple with, can we comply with this? And uh, until we know that question, we'd better not uh, even try and do business with EU residents, and maybe our ultimate decision is not to do business with EU residents, and maybe that would be the way this goes too. Um, so it's, uh, I, I think you're right on that that it will be this interesting back and forth as to um, how much the EU is anxious to have services like YouTube uh, accessible to its residents or not, and and what sort of influences are driving. Um, this proposed directive in the first place, as you pointed out earlier. So uh, stay tuned on this one um, and and don't lose sight of it. I mean, it's definitely important and, and should it be enacted in its current form, it's, it's a game changer. All right, uh, from something fairly serious to something really that has very little, if anything at all, to do with technology law. Uh, but um, various listeners sent it my way, knowing our interest in copyright. And of course, um, knowing everyone's interest in cheese. <laughs> so speaking of the EU, uh, its highest court has an interesting decision uh, that involved a, a dispute between manufacturers of 
really delicious sounding cheese spread uh, involving scallions and herbs. And it just makes me want to uh, parsley and leeks. Uh, I just want to stop the show and go eat some of this. Um, I, again, I can't pronounce what it, it's actually called. Uh, Hexnikaz is my best uh, attempt at a Lavola product which uh, thankfully has an, an English uh, surname as well, which is cheese made from cream cheese and herbs and vegetables, including parsley and parsley and leek and garlic. Uh, and then there was another company called Smilda uh, with its own herbed cheese dip with many of the same ingredients. And creatively enough, uh, Lavola, uh, the creator of the witch's cheese decided uh, to bring a suit claiming that the taste of its cheese was copyrighted. And uh, the EU's high court said, no, we really don't think that taste is something that can be sufficiently objective, uh, sufficiently identifiable to be subject to copyright protection. But uh, it, it did seem to leave some wiggle room. I thought it's really interesting to read the New York Times piece on this as to um, if you were to craft uh, some sort of, I guess, description of your cheese or have your cheese um, have, it, 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 here we go. We have an expert in this piece, uh, the chairman of intellectual property technology and communications group at the law firm of Baker and McKenzie, who comes out and says, for anyone who wants to protect taste, smell, touch, those sorts of sensory perceptions of a product, it pretty much takes copyright off the table. Uh, but I, I, I am gleaning that if you were to um, have a taste that was sufficiently objectively identifiable, uh, you might have some wiggle room here. What do you think, Stefan? Is that just too big uh, a stone to try and push up the hill? So I don't know what the underlying statute there says. Um, if, mm -hmm. if it doesn't protect uh, taste or smell uh, on its face, I have a hard time reading that into whatever the original uh, language would be. Uh, and if it did protect it, presumably this case wouldn't have been controversial. So let's start with the assumption that you don't protect taste. I don't see how you get from traditional expressions of copyright to taste uh, without um, a serious revision of the of the language of the statute. So this seems to be the right decision. Uh, I think I you know in the article <laughs> it refers to it's a discrimination of senses that something you can taste with your mouth is not protectable by copyright, and that has to be one. I have to imagine this person was. Um, to some degree joking, if not, that, that's got to be one of the oddest <laughs> invocations of the concept of discrimination I've ever seen. <laughs> um, but in any case, um, this is a funny story. Uh, I, I hope that we don't see copyright litigation spiraling out of control related to the taste of beer, for example. Uh, there's a lot of companies making similarly flavored hop, hoppy IPAs. If they start suing each other, we're, you know, That'll be a death knell for civilization as we know it, I think. Right. The The other way in which maybe a food could be copyrighted, it's pointed out here, is, is sort of in line with the Star Athletica, the cheerleading uh, design, uniform design case that we've talked about from the United States Supreme Court, uh, where it really, if it's more of the visual aspect of the food that's being copyrighted, maybe there's a path, an easier path toward there, uh, toward copyright there. So... Um, it, it just is a fascinating uh, case and uh, sorry, there's not much of a tech tie in here, but our, our uh, tech loving audience loves cheese apparently too, because a few different people sent me this article and wanted to make sure that I saw it. So thank you for that. Um, and now I, I'm just hungry. I will yes, add Stephen? one thing though. If you, if you get into an environment where let's say you're making lab grown meat and that the lab grown mm. meat is, is being manufactured uh, through the use of some source code, for example, I, you know, you would program the device, and, and that source code uh, is copyrighted. And, and let's say, for whatever reason, the the algorithms and the code that's necessary to make really delicious lab-grown meat are, are narrow, and and it's it's very difficult for anybody to kind of come up with an alternative. Then you could see 
um, maybe copyright protection coming into the picture that way, where you're using a program to make something real. You can't protect the thing, but maybe you can protect the underlying source code. And if the only way you can grow that lab meat is through the use of those algorithms or, and source code, then maybe you get to it that way. So it's not, um, it's not impossible for me to imagine a scenario where you've got copyright protection affecting things people eat, but it would have to be in that indirect uh, using something that is otherwise copyrightable to arrive at the food. Uh, that's kind of the only way I can imagine existing laws capturing it. Right, and what you're describing would, it sounds like, involve some patent protection too if you had developed some perhaps patentable approach toward creating a certain taste. Um, so maybe there would be IP protection in, in another way as well. But uh, here the tasty cheese seems to have um, not garnered the copyright protection of the high court of the EU. Maybe we'll make tasty cheese our first MCLE password, uh, passphrase of this episode of This Week in Law. We put these phrases into the show in case you are a lawyer or other professional who likes to watch or listen to our show to uh, assist you in meeting the professional education requirements in your field. So uh, tasty cheese will be our first phrase. And if you need more information about uh, MCLE in the United States, head on over to twit.to slash MCLE. We have a chart there that will hopefully help you. And we will put another passphrase in before we wrap the show up today. And right now we're gonna wrap up our discussion of copyright per se and move on to discussing at least one copyright related concern in the realm of entertainment. I just love highlighting these kinds of stories when they occur uh, because we were just referencing the DMCA notice and takedown process that we do have in place here in the United States uh, that would supplant or address the kinds of concerns as this proposed EU copyright directive. The DMCA is far from perfect either and it leads to some rather silly outcomes sometimes. And it's uh, appearing that one of those may have happened here concerning Epic, Epic Games and a trailer for its mega hit Fortnite. Uh, EFF and others have caught, uh, God, God love Reddit. I mean, people just will take a screenshot of anything and post it to Reddit. And then we can all talk about what happened that maybe uh, was too embarrassing for a company to uh, highlight or hope that it might go away. Uh, this appears to be what happened here. Uh, there was a trailer posted uh, by Epic Games for Fortnite, which someone went to go try and access and got that iconic uh, message that YouTube provides you when it's something has been pulled down because of a DMCA takedown notice. Uh, screenshotted that, posted to Reddit, and um, so we know that uh, something went on there. What we don't know are the details, and so EFF is uh, speculating as to whether Epic Games sent a takedown notice to itself. Uh, that, that seems to be a likely uh, possibility for what happened here. Um, it, what EFF speculates is uh, if Epic Games had an automated process that just sends out takedowns for everything that matches its content, then we are seeing a brand new example of why copyright bots don't work. Someone forgot to make sure that Epic Games' own accounts were excluded from the search and it DMCA'd itself. Uh, that still means a bogus, bogus takedown was sent. The other alternative is perhaps someone was pretending to be Epic Games and sent a takedown request and that's also not supposed to happen under the DMCA. So either way, uh, it's sort of highlighting the imperfections of this system. Uh, the uh, trailer, I assume, is back in action and the takedown request, if it was sent by Epic Games, uh, out of play. So what do you think of this, Stefan? I have a lot of respect for EFF, but I think they're being a little bit unfair here. This, you know, they're, they're attributing this to the DMCA. This sounds like a human error or someone just forgot to, <laughs> forgot to mm. make sure that Epic's own content wasn't, wasn't being uh, included in the searches for this 
these purposes. So to me, it kind of sounds like human error, not to defend the statute or, or how it's implemented, but this really just sounds like an intern or somebody, somebody at Epic screwed up and, and didn't do it properly. And, and, and it kind of resulted in the silly, um, take down to itself. It's, it's kind of, I just kind of see it as a silly story and not really indicative of much. Uh, but it is pretty funny and, and it does indeed highlight sort of the risks of, uh, giving too much control over to robots without thinking about, um, the inputs and, and who's making decisions about what, what's, what's put into the searches that they're running. So, but you know, the, the, the framing of the story was very much, uh, finger wagging at the DMCA where maybe hmm. they should identify the individual at, at Epic who screwed up and shame them instead. <laughs> right. And and where we've seen examples of this before, uh, you, you're precisely correct that that perhaps the DMCA is sort of our, our good compromise solution to something like the EU proposed copyright directive. And that what the reason we see sort of ridiculous things like this happen is perhaps right in hand, not knowing what left left hand is doing within companies where a marketing uh, promotion department really wants to get something out there. And the legal department isn't advised that it's coming and, and hasn't put um, safeguards or sufficient uh, procedures in place to know that while it's out there policing the rest of the web, it's going to be using its own copyrightable content too to promote itself. And, and that you don't want silly things like this to happen as a result. And those two parts of a company really need to be on the same page about how they're going to uh, perform their respective tasks. So uh, always fun to see an example of something like this. And then uh, Stefan, this was one of your contributions to the show <laughs> today, and and it's going to segue well. We're going to talk about um, uh, influencers and requirements on social media in just a moment here, and people who may not be disclosing everything that folks might want to know about them. Tell us about Threaten. Uh, so Threaten appears to be a successful. LA based metal band with a large online following that was doing a good job booking tours throughout the UK with strong advanced sales and, and attracting uh, people to its shows. And they booked up this entire tour. It turned out that the online following that, that Threaten had was uh, fraudulent or fake anyway. That um, It was, uh, or let's just say suspicious. It didn't seem to be real people behind it. Uh, and when, when the concerts were about to start, rather than having uh, venues with 500 people in them all buying drinks, you know, three people would show up and the venues lost money and, and the tour had to be canceled. And so what makes this interesting to me is you, you take the maximum of fake it till you make it uh, and, and you put a little twist on it with online bots essentially. And so, you know, any successful artist has goes through a phase where their confidence has to uh, exceed their actual uh, talent uh, or their popularity. In this case, the threatened, took that stage of fake it till you make it and added um, essentially bots to it in a hope in the hopes of making it faster than they otherwise would have. And the whole thing backfired and, re and revealed the band to be um, really not having any kind of a fan base at all. And they got in a little bit of trouble uh, because of it. And it, it sounds like a totally silly example, but I just think it's interesting because so much of what we do in our lives involves us uh, having to kind of take risks, bet on ourselves uh, and and really exceed our ability to perform a task by just throwing ourselves into the deep end and, and learning on the fly. Now you can augment that process with fake followers and try to convince and persuade people that you're actually more successful than you are in a way that's indistinguishable from uh, reality. I mean, if you were to log on to the site and see a bunch of followers, people engaging with the content, providing reviews, uh, you might believe that to be true uh, and you might act on it. And in this case, that didn't work out. Not enough people believed it and the whole fraud fell apart. Um, it's almost like a popularity Ponzi scheme, right? As long as it seem, it, you seem to be popular, you become popular and the fake becomes real. In this case, that Ponzi scheme collapsed because the fake never became real. And I just think um, this is a very silly example of that, but you can imagine uh, many others that, that could be more consequential, whether it involves 
products that people end up investing in and losing a lot of money or mm-hmm. uh, uh, other commitments that people make on the basis of thinking, I don't want to miss out on this. Everybody else is already a part of it. Uh, and if it turns out that you made that decision based on bot behavior that, that wasn't real, uh, it, it creates interesting questions, uh, both legally because in, in a sense you've been misled. Uh, and if you lose money, who's responsible for that? And it also just kind of creates interesting questions philosophically because that line between what's real and what isn't when you're relying on the impression of popularity that's being created by online bots is, uh, to me anyway, very interesting. It's really interesting. And, and I really love, uh, your take on it. Um, and I, I have a couple of things I'm wondering about as the result of this story, uh, places where the law might involve itself as a result of this kind of conduct. The first real obvious one is fraud law is one of the oldest, most established uh, ways that we can go after one another if someone has lied to you and caused you to rely on those lies to take steps that damage you, you can sue them for fraud. And it seems like that's what these club venue owners might be interested in doing here because they were led to believe one thing and it just wasn't true. And uh, they lost money as a result. So it seems like we have a legal framework that's at least partially equipped to deal with this kind of thing. But I don't, what I then think about is the volume and the scale at which this must be happening. Um, Knowing that if you're, as you say, a a creative person, like an artist, like a threaten here, or if you're just a small business and you're trying to make your way through the world of what it looks like to market that business today, you're gonna get bombarded by people who want to have you pay for fake followers on social media to bump up your numbers and help you fake it till you make it, as you put it, Stefan. And and that as that small business person, you're probably not giving too much thought to, gee, if I do this, I'm committing fraud. <laughs> what you're probably thinking is, oh, this is a tool that's gonna help me grow as a business. And you're not really probably thinking through the ramifications of where it might land you. I think we're in sort of this legal ethical gray area here with what, marketing, conventional marketing might look like today. And and I wonder if the law might get involved at, at that juncture too and start to regulate that practice. What do you think about that? I, I think about this a lot in the context of when I travel and I go to a new city and I am trying to figure out where to eat. And, and there's various websites that kind of help you narrow, like, you know, help you find the best restaurant, whatever neighborhood you're in. And it, it's amazing to me, you know, I, every city you go to in the U.S. has, you know, the same dozen restaurants, just slightly, slightly different variations of the same dozen restaurants. Uh, and the descriptions are always the same, always four stars. People are always so enthusiastic. And it just it's so disorienting to be in New York and Atlanta and Minneapolis and Dallas and Seattle and San Francisco and everything is just the same. And I think that marketing angle that you're describing of, you know, people being persuaded to use social media to kind of create enthusiasm and create an impression of, of success um, and attracting customers on that basis. It, it, it just, it has this really homogenizing effect. So apart from any kind of, um, you know, legal consequences, it's just kind of demoralizing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but, but beyond that, I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, and, and the, the, you know, fraud law, it, I don't know if it was intended to apply to this kind of thing where at the end of the day, if you spend your money at a restaurant because you thought it was more popular than it was because of online followers, there's kind of a caveat emptor thing there where it's like, mm-hmm. you know, you went online, you read some reviews, you, you believe that they were written by actual fans of the restaurant. Turns out it was, paid bots, but you know, you took that risk when you relied on, on this consumer, this unverified consumer account that this was a good place to eat. Um, so your money, you spent your money and, and, and maybe you were kind of lied to on some level, but maybe you shouldn't be relying on these obviously, uh, puffed up sources to, to be making those purchasing decisions. Uh, it's a, 
you know, there's a line and, and maybe, you know, if you're dealing with food, it's one thing. If, if it's medical services, then it's another, you know, if a doctor is using this kind of thing to promote fake experience with surgeries, you go in to get a surgery done by a particular doctor and it turns out all of those positive reviews were fake and, and you get injured, maybe that goes to the tort liability that doctor faces. So I think there's a sliding scale depending on the kind of product you're dealing with or service that you're dealing with. Um, but it would be interesting to have some real policy discussion of at what point does this kind of fake influencer involvement transform something uh, innocuous into something legally uh, salient. And I actually think it's just a very interesting uh, area. I, I do too. And, and I think that you've honed in on something here that is as dangerous and prevalent as the fake news that we see so much discussed and thought about by regulators, lawmakers, et cetera. Um, and really in the United States anyway, the, the regulators and lawmakers that are charged with dealing with this kind of situation are the FTC and maybe local um, consumer protection bodies. Uh, but but I, I'm not seeing Congress clamor to make sure that your restaurant review uh, conclusions are as sound and solid as the ones that you might be getting uh, from the politically related news that you're reading online. Um, both are capable of manipulation. Uh, one is maybe less threatening to the fabric of society as a whole than the other, but it's still dangerous and concerning. Um, people, I don't think, have the sophistication to, I think the term you used a moment were ago was obviously puffed up reviews. I don't think that people consider that things are obviously puffed up. I think they go on Yelp and they see four or five stars and they go, hey, must be a great place. And so it becomes incumbent on the platform whether they're going to um, have that, they're going to warrant that degree of trust or not. And if if they're not warranting it, maybe that's when uh, the law needs to get involved. So I think this is a fascinating story and a really good segue into talking about um, the social web stories that we further have on deck for today. Okay, this is not going to help matters at all. Uh, but apparently, um, we, we've been discussing social media influencers. Uh, everyone sort of, I think, has their idea of what that world looks like um, and how someone who is a celebrity and has a lot of followers can uh, influence what they buy, where they go, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now there is this niche developing called the nano influencer, where really all you might need is something like a thousand followers. And yet you're getting uh, offers and deals and promotions from people who want you to endorse their product, uh, plug their event, et cetera, et cetera. So it's it just, it's becoming a much more fine grained and smaller and long, long tail oriented sort of arrangement where uh, the economics of that seem to be penciling out for people. Uh, and the reason I say that means it's gonna get worse is because, you know, presumably if you're Kendall Jenner, you have people around you who are at least paying attention to and trying to protect you from running afoul of the law. Uh, if you're someone who um, has an Instagram channel because you're great at style and you're developing your uh, followers and you're helping uh, your fake it till you make it process by taking in some money from people who want you to endorse your products, you might not be very well versed at all with what the FTC's requirements are for that and what you have to and what you don't have to do. I do think that um, there's been such a convention that's developed where people see that people are require, uh, 
uh, complying with the FTC requirements and putting things like hashtag sponsor or hashtag spawn or hashtag ad or has, you know, they're making disclosure disclosures in the way um, that are required. And they, they, at least that's visible enough uh, that it's giving people the notion that maybe something like that might be required. Uh, but I, I don't think that the notion of going to nano influencers, I think it's going to get make the situation worse before it makes it better. What do you think, Stefan? I actually kind of love the concept of nano influencers um, in, in the abstract. Like I like the idea that brands have thought of this because if I were to want to purchase something based on you know someone's social media behavior, it would help target kind of more niche products and and you know. It, it's just not that helpful to have someone who like Rihanna or anybody who has like millions and millions of followers endorse something. It doesn't it doesn't feel real. It feels very much paid. Whereas if someone who has a thousand followers really likes something, there, there's a feeling of authenticity there that I'm sure uh, marketers want to exploit. Uh, but mm -hmm. I, it makes sense to me. It's very intuitive, um, and I like the idea that that they're thinking at that level of granularity because the reality is, as much as we complain about being advertised to all the time, uh, at the end of the day, you need to buy stuff, uh, it, you know, as part of your life. And it's nice to be able to find the stuff that uh, that suits your lifestyle and your and your goals and whatever you want. Uh, it, it's nice to be able to find that stuff and sort of trust that what you're buying is going to fit with um, whatever goal you're buying it for. So I think that breaking down marketing to finer levels of granularity and targeting people that way could actually provide people with better products in the end, which again, I, I realize I'm sounding kind of like a marketing person here, but I, I'm trying to have a good faith interpretation of what they're doing here, which is to kind of get people what they want, which isn't such a bad thing. Um, I agree that the FTC implications can be very confusing. I, I certainly don't know them and, and, um, and the less good faith interpretation of this nano influencer trend is that is going to, very quickly devolve into just uh, rather than having one disingenuous marketing campaign, you're going to have dozens of smaller disingenuous marketing campaigns that are tricking people <laughs> um, yeah. into believing that that someone actually likes something. And you know, in my own life, where this has become relevant is, I, I really wanted a pair of boots that would be appropriate for the Seattle winter, and I went down this rabbit hole of trying to find online a reliable review site where, that would identify good boots and. If you've never done something like this, I, I really recommend it because if you're trying to understand just how frustrating this process can be because you go on any website and it, it's made up of these kind of you know lo-fi boot reviewer guys. There's like a dozen of them online and you can never really tell whether their opinion is, is paid for or not. And I tracked one of them. I thought, okay, this seems kind of real and I you know, trusted it. And I bought the boots online based on this person's recommendation and they were unwearable. I had to, I had to return them. And it was one of those things where I, now I'm asking myself, did that person really truly wear this pair of boots and think that they were good or, were, or was <laughs> I being lied to? Uh, and if, you know, that can only happen so many times before you really get fed up with the whole process. And so th th there's the range, I guess, on the best good faith interpretation of this nano influencer trend is it's going to help people find things they actually want. The odds of it actually staying, uh, you know, within those parameters are very slim. I see it much more likely that it's going to just get corrupted, uh, and become just kind of a headache for people who don't understand what's real and what's not real. And <laughs> they'll just want to go to Macy's and get a pair of boots the old fashioned way. Yeah. Uh, buyer beware becomes super important in that kind of scenario. And, and I think it becomes important, too, for people who decide, hey, I could definitely augment my uh, online footprint and my ability to reach people and just my ability to keep paying the bills while I'm continuing to develop this online persona by taking in some money from some people who want me to endorse their products. And, and I'm wondering if people who do that really understand the ramifications of, yeah, they're going to make you comply with what you told them you would do. Uh, there, the New York Times story on this nano influencer trend brings up um, a 20 year old fashion model named Luca Sabat or Sabat. Uh, he has 1.4 million Instagram followers and Snap of Snapchat. I don't think we call it Snapchat anymore. I think we just call it Snap. Uh, you remember they came out with those spectacles 
where mm-hmm. you could walk through the world and and snap your experiences using the spectacles. They commissioned this model to do a few things. Uh, was supposed to, I think, do a post and then wear the spectacles around during uh, fashion week and uh, didn't do it. Um, hold on, I think I'm confusing one part of the article with another. Let me make sure that I've got the right influencer. Uh, yeah, it's the right influencer. He was offered $60,000 for providing one Instagram post and three Instagram stories. We'll talk about Instagram stories later on in the show too. And for being photographed during fashion week while wearing the spectacles. Uh, the um, PR firm who hired him uh, didn't feel like he delivered. So they came out and sued him. There was a lawsuit about, you know, oh, you didn't do your thing for us. And I, I wonder if people really realize I'm going to have to do this or the $60,000 I got is is uh, not going to stay in my bank account. So uh, a, a lot of things for people to think about as they navigate those waters. Uh, your firm's blog, Stefan, uh, had a related kind of concern that it raised, uh, we've talked about this before on the show as well, that maybe the influencer that you are relying upon, uh, hopefully if they're not a real person, that's been disclosed too. Uh, because I would think that that would impact whether you wanted to buy boots from them or not. Uh, Sarah Robertson as your firm has a post on the rise of CGI influencers. So um, something that is completely uh, fabricated and yet could be compelling, could be entertaining, could be fun for someone to follow. But I sure as heck hope that uh, there would be adequate disclosure of the fact that the influencing influencer that you're following uh, is not an actual person. What do you think about this landscape, Stefan? I thought I thought this was a great post by Sarah in our New York office, uh, fellow Canadian, I might add. Um, mm-hmm. She she um I think she did a great job here, kind of laying out the issues. I encourage people to read the post, but the you know the thing that struck me about it is the idea that companies might <clears throat> might want to involve CGI influencers because they're easier to deal with uh, than people uh, than human influencers, as she put it. And it's an interesting thing to think about because everybody now knows that when you see a picture of a you know a real person in a magazine, it's so highly processed. Uh, often that they'll even swap out body parts. That the the line between what's real and what's not real has been muddled in people's minds for some time. Uh, nobody expects a, a human that that's been photographed and put in a magazine to look the same way in real life. And so this just seems to be that next step in the evolution of well, if we've accepted people pictures of humans in magazines that are really not very reflective of how that human actually looks, why wouldn't we accept a very realistic CGI influencer who ultimately serves the same uh, function uh, in terms of, you know, advertisers goals, which is you look at the picture and, and you project onto it some sort of desire about what you want to look like or what you want somebody in your life to look like. And, that ability to empathize with a very lifelike CGI person uh, shouldn't really be all that different from someone who's ostensibly tied to a human being but has been manipulated to the point of no longer resembling that human being. So the leap from highly processed real person to CGI person isn't that big of a leap. And ultimately, Mm -hmm. what's going on in your own mind while you observe the behavior of the CGI person uh, isn't all that different. It's you're projecting yourself or some desire that you have onto it. Uh, and so, you know, a few weeks ago, we talked about sex robots. That's a different issue, I think, because there you're actually physically engaging with something here. This is just thinking about um, a commercial purchase based on the, some projection that only exists in your mind, whether the underlying object of that projection is real or not. And so from the perspective of the brands, I could see, you know, instead of paying somebody a lot of money uh, and dealing with their unpredictability and the fact that they might drink and drive or, or abuse somebody and then damage your brand, you can really control with no moral implications whatsoever the behavior of a CGI avatar. And so lower upfront cost, lower risk, uh, and same sort of marketing angle as soon as people accept that what they're looking at is just a projection of their desires. And so I think yeah. it's a really interesting next step in that evolution of of just uh, taking 
advertising to a point where you're actually in some ways improving the moral calculus by removing um, the kind of manipulation of the real and just acknowledging the fake for what it is. Yeah, I mean, that's my concern is that do we get to this point where um, it's hard to distinguish whether it's fake or real? And I, I, I think that you've already laid out why it might be uh, and that people's decisions might be impacted by whether uh, they're interacting with a strictly uh, fantastical marketing creation or an actual person. But as you say, the brands themselves um, certainly, Shudu, the world's first digital supermodel, uh, who's featured in this post, uh, if she says she's going to <laughs> do Snapchat story or Instagram stories featuring her wearing Snapchat spectacles, which seems like a weird thing to ask her to do, but that seems to be what Snap asked uh, the supermodel discussed in, or the 20 year old model, uh, male model discussed in the New York Times piece. Um, that they're not going to have to come sue Shudu if she doesn't comply. She's not going to not comply. She's going to do what you hired her to do or you programmed her to do. Um, so that's one concern that's taken off the table. But um, you know, I certainly hope that as this develops, uh, we're constantly paying attention to people uh, being advised and having disclosures made to them uh, who exactly or what exactly they're interacting with. Um, it's it's a really fascinating development. It also reminds me of the Jet Li story we did a couple of weeks ago uh, where it became public why he decided not to be in, I forget if it was one or both of the um, Matrix reboots because he didn't want to have his you know body of work as a martial artist become the property of the studio pr producing the films, uh, then perhaps to be uh, in the future, put on to some sort of CGI influencer or actor or what have you, uh, licensed out as the studio saw fit. So um, again, you you see the conflict or tension there between the rights of uh, real people and what brands and studios and uh, business in general will do with uh, individuals who are not real, but created to sell you things or influence you in one way or another. I, it's absolutely fascinating. Any final thoughts before we move on? Um, yeah, I think as long as there's appropriate disclosures about whether what you're watching is, is real or not, I think the moral calculus actually skews in favor of, of CGI influencers in some ways, because we've read a lot about this sort of you know, implications of the modeling life on on the people who model, whether it's eating disorders or other kind of um, problems that emerge from the way that they're treated. And if you, you know, if you stop exploiting real people and instead just make a pure virtual marketing tool, it, it, it to me, it seems like it, it has the potential for uh, fewer of those negative externalities. Now, on the other hand, people might still look at that CGI is an improbably pro proportioned CGI yes. avatar and decide that, you know, they, they actually want to then mimic the avatar and, and not actually make the leap that, well, that's actually a robot or, or a, an avatar. I'm not going to try to emulate it. And maybe it will still have the exact same downstream effect. So maybe, um, maybe it'll actually worsen them because you can, you're not limited in any way by, by human proportion. So right. maybe I and should I, provide as I think about it, maybe I should revise my thoughts on this. Well, I do think that that there is, um, as you say, the the moral calculus is skewed by one's knowledge that what I'm looking at is not real. It's not even doctored up with mm -hmm. software and corrections. It's just flat out not real, and and that that's got to hopefully help uh, people from internalizing and and thinking. I need to look like that thing that's not real. I'm sure that there are some people who who would still think, you know, that's the ideal and I need to emulate it and uh, its reality or, or feasibility be damned. But, um, you know, I think you and I are straying into the realm of um, psychologists and mental health and that's not our expertise. Right. So um, uh, a really interesting area to... Um, to monitor. Uh, again, someone who uh, 
wants to manipulate reality and one's impressions of reality. I just love this story. I'm, I'm hoping that lots of you saw it and loved it too. Uh, excited we get to talk about it on the show. Uh, this is the gentleman who is in Holland, I believe. He's Dutch. Uh, he is 69 years old. He is a user of online dating platforms. And he has been told by his medical professionals that he has the body of a four and the health and the stamina and everything else of a 49 year old. And so he wants to, you know, he, he's taking the approach that if we can be fluid with our gender definitions and classifications in today's modern world, why shouldn't the same apply to age? And he wants to legally change his age from 69 to 49 uh, so that his um, online persona better matches uh, what he's being told about his physical health and state. Uh, Stefan, are you in? Uh, well, the, the premise of what he's trying to do here you know, it feels a little, it feels a little um, potentially dismissive of the real, um, the real concerns that people in the trans community have about their gender identity. And I think to kind of piggyback off of that and, and try to kind of do this little stunt is, is a little bit offensive, I think. I don't know if he's intending for this to, to seem like a stunt or if he's being sincere, but I could imagine uh, people in the trans community being a little bit offended by this much in the way as they were by Rachel Dolezal. I don't know if you remember her, but she was the white woman yeah. who uh, portrayed herself as black. I think mm -hmm. that um, to equate time and gender due to his dating sort of lack of luck dating on Tinder to me seems a little bit of <laughs> a little bit offensive, a little maybe not totally thought out. Um, on, on the other hand, um, uh, you know, he's a, celebrity I, I understand he's a celebrity in Holland and he's, he's maybe mm -hmm. just sort of doing this as an act of self-promotion and not really trying to make a political statement so um, it's it's great clickbait uh, I, I'm not sure that it makes a lot of sense <laughs> but I'll, yeah. I'll reserve judgment on his on level of his sincerity yeah I mean the other thing if he were to be making a political statement and one that we might feel more sympathetic toward, uh, it might be about age discrimination, right? I mean, it's hard right. to sympathize with him wanting to uh, do better with the ladies by fudging his age or or that would do better with uh, whomever he is interested in. Uh, but uh, just because we're so youth obsessed as uh, seen by our uh, earlier discussion of CGI influencers who can achieve some sort of ideal that a normal human actually just couldn't. But um, uh, this piece that we linked to at MarketWatch uh, does have some numbers about the rise in age discrimination suits. Uh, the EEOC um, said that age discrimination complaints reached a record of uh, 24,582 in 2008 and declined to 18,376 in 2017. Now, I don't for a minute think that that decline is related to we're being better about age discrimination. I just say I think it's a problem in the country that is and, and maybe in the world uh, that's not um, being that, that is systemic and not being pursued uh, necessarily as aggressively as it could be. Um, so, you know, I, I still think I, I'm with you, Stefan, that I think this smacks more of a stunt than anything else, but um, it, it is an interesting reflection on our society that someone might want to um, manipulate his perceivers uh, reality of his age. So, um, very good point about the age discrimination. I should have I should have yeah. mentioned that. That yes, if to the extent that's his real point, um, he should have found a different way of making it. But but the age discrimination is obviously a big issue, and I, I'm struck actually by how early it starts to become an issue. I have friends who uh, work in house at various companies that typically hire uh, young engineers straight out of undergrad, and people in their you know, mid to early 30s are feeling old uh, in, in professional environments, and uh, not not just old in this kind of like, oh, I feel old, I can't hang out with, with the kids kind of way, 
but in the it, it appears to impact their careers because because they aren't seen as sort of young and vital and hip in, in the way that they need to be seen as to feel comfortable at work. And so that that um, concept is actually a, a real seems to be a real problem, and it starts quite young. And so I, I wish he'd found a different way of approaching the issue if, if that was his goal. But um, definitely a, a good faith reading of, of his uh, stunt is that he's at least pointing to a real problem. Yeah, I, I think as a society, we've we've gotten away from valuing experience and wisdom and and put for good reasons value on being nimble and flexible and amenable to change and perhaps more malleable if you're younger. But, um, you know, most workplaces benefit from both kinds of employee. And uh, maybe there are plenty of people out there that um, fit the bill regardless of their age. So uh, it, it is an interesting uh, point to make if that's also what he's trying to get at. So before we get away from sort of talking about influencers and fashion and all, I think this would be a good time to thank our sponsor, for this episode of This Week in Law, which is Slide Belts by Brig Taylor. Uh, they are high quality, comfortable belts that are easy to adjust. So coincidentally enough, I actually have my slide belt right here. Love to show it to you. I have the white model that is not leather. It's one of their vegan materials. Uh, but it's great. I love, you know, I don't have that much, uh, that many white belts in my wardrobe. So it's great to have this for those occasions when I need a white belt. And uh, the technology of it is just fantastic. The buckle itself, I think is really stylish and attractive. And to slide it on, all you do is push through that buckle and there are little ratchets on the other side, you'll hear them that lock it tight once you're there. But don't worry, you're not locked into wherever you have ratcheted in. If you need to loosen it up while you're wearing it, all you do is just pop out the buckle right there and it slides easily back to maybe a more comfortable kind of location. So you can get ready for the holidays and uh, have a lot of flexibility with how tight or how loose your belt is. Stefan, you'll have to um, tell me if the same thing is going on in the world of men's attire as has been going on in the world of women's attire. But uh, for women, high waists have come back big time. Uh, quote unquote mom jeans, which we all laughed at people for wearing. I believe we laughed at Barack Obama for wearing, <laughs> but they are back with a vengeance. And so if you're gonna wear one belt that'll work with your pants that sit a little lower, and then it also work with them when you're wearing them right on your waist, you're gonna need to be able to adjust that belt so that it uh, will work with whatever fashion you're wearing. Also, I love to wear a belt over a dress. So you really need that kind of belt to be able to cinch up tight because there's very little between uh, you and uh, what you're wearing and that juncture. So love these slide belts by Brig Taylor. Maybe you don't think about belts that often, but don't forget the holiday season is approaching. And in addition to uh, wanting to have a great gift, uh, for those on your holiday list, let's you know be very real that not only do we need to adjust our belts uh, based on what fashions we're wearing, but maybe based on how much we've indulged in the holidays. <laughs> it's nice to have a slide belt for that kind of scenario too. There are no holes in this belt whatsoever. What happens is you get it and you measure your waist and where you would like the belt to sit and then you cut the belt at just the right place. And there are little markings on the belt to make that work easily. You attach the buckle, it very securely attaches to where you've cut the belt. And you know you can adjust from there. I left mine a little big so that I would have a lot of play and could make the belt you know, as tight as I want or as uh, large as I wanted, that I'd left myself enough room to really wear it in a lot of different scenarios. But you may find that you have you know, less range that you want to uh, involve in your belt measurement process. It's such an improvement on the traditional belt. You can easily remove that buckle 
and mix and match it with other straps. You know, if you're a wearer of smart watches, you may have become used to doing that with your watch band. Uh, now you can do it with your belt as well. Uh, you can choose from full grain and top grain leather straps to high quality canvas and animal friendly vegan straps. The one that I'm wearing is the latter variety. Uh, you can wear your slide belt casually around the house, at the office, or at your holiday parties. Again, uh, they come in many different styles. Uh, it's so easy to remove. It's also a great travel belt, especially while going through security. It just you know, comes right off, goes through the machine if you need to. There's not much metal involved. It probably um, will go. I haven't tried it through the security machine, but the buckle's so small, I can generally get something like that through security. So you might not even have to take it off. Uh, slide belts are an excellent gift option the holiday season uh, from unisex survival belts and colorful belts for kids to skinny belts for women. So whoever's on your list, you're going to find something that works well for them on the gifting front. And I'm guessing you're going to find something you like there too. Before you check out of the uh, website there, you should click on their gift sets tab for some great offers, but do note that these sets are already discounted. So the offer that we can give you as a listener to this week, week in law, that's not gonna apply to the gift sets there. They're covered by a one year warranty, free exchanges and no hassle returns. If you're ready for a better belt, go to slidebelts.com slash twit. Use the code twit at checkout to receive 20% off your order. That's slidebelts.com slash twit. And don't forget to use the code TWIT for 20% off. Thank you so much, Slide Belts. I love my Slide Belt. Uh, and we love your support of This Week in Law. All right, moving on. Uh, we're not quite ready to leave the world of influencing and influencers yet. Uh, though we are going to bring in the SEC to this discussion. Uh, and I promised you we'd come back to Snap and stories, etc. Uh, there is a shareholders action against SNAP. And uh, now federal regulators are getting involved and asking questions about that lawsuit and asking SNAP to provide information about what was disclosed to investors about its rivalry with Instagram. So it brings up, I think, a really a couple of really interesting topics for our show today. Number one, uh, we're already talking so much about disclosures today and what you have to be upfront about with. Uh, we've been talking about it in the terms of lay people, but it gets really, really serious if you're doing an IPO for stock as Snap did, and you have perhaps not disclosed everything that you needed to to your investors for them to make informed decisions about making that investment. And that's what this lawsuit alleges uh, and will play out there. Uh, but the Justice Department and Securities Exchange Commission have subpoenaed SNAP for details about its IPO looking into those disclosures. So um, that is ongoing. But what I think is, is also equally interesting here uh, that we haven't talked much about on the show, uh, but happens over and over again in the technology industry. And that is an upstart like SNAP comes up with a technology that people love and a methodology for um, connecting with users where they do small time sensitive video logs that you can share and maybe with just a limited group of people and then it goes away. There seems to be um, quite a demand for that. And uh, we see a similar product on Instagram uh, seeming to um, you know, clone or copy or model exactly what Snap came out with, Instagram stories, uh, and maybe lapping doing far better than Snap is doing these days with its product. So uh, the extent to which companies can um, emulate each other, uh, I don't think there are any allegations that uh, there were trade secrets that were misappropriated here, but in the realm of intellectual property, you're always concerned with, you know, how uh, how close something can be to something else and the fairness of all of that. So uh, I think it's this story is interesting from that standpoint as well. Uh, Stefan, any thoughts? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of these plaintiffs class actions against companies whenever the stock price goes down. Uh, I don't know any, I don't really know a lot of details about securities laws in particular, uh, this 
I don't know anything about this particular lawsuit, but the thought that somebody wouldn't have been aware of Snap's rivalry with Facebook and Instagram at the time of the IPO seems pretty laughable to me. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe there's a serious issue here somewhere, but these are, you know, known competitors in a, in a tight space uh, where there's a market market leader and, and uh, you know, someone trying to come up as an insurgent. So it doesn't, mm-hmm. <laughs> doesn't really seem that, you know, the subpoena, the subpoena documents here are going to change much, but who yeah. knows? I haven't seen the disclosures either. And, and it seems like, you know, any security lawyer worth their salt is going to have taken that into account. And, you know, they tend to be far more conservative with their disclosures, throw in everything but the kitchen sink and make sure the company doesn't get subjected to SEC scrutiny down the road. So the fact that um, Instagram had a similar product or could potentially develop a similar product um, to Snap's core business model, um, you know, seems like the kind of thing that would be included in disclosures. And uh, maybe we will learn uh, when these subpoenas have um, come to fruition, whether uh, they, it was included or not, um, and and how the timing worked, right? Did the product even, the competing product even exist yet? So um, interesting developments there for Snap. Our final uh, story in the social web category for today involves Google as an influencer uh, in a really interesting arrangement promoting its Google Pixel phone and specifically the camera in that phone, which uh, has been promoted and, and reviewed as a really great phone camera. The marketing department in charge of the Google Pixel phone Uh, entered into a partnership with Condé Nast magazines such that there are various photographs appearing in those magazines that were taken with the Google Pixel 3 phone and yet are disclosed to have been taken with that phone and the partnership with Google disclosed in very subtle ways, if at all. So what you're seeing is things like a cover shot on Allure magazine, which is uh, owned by Condé Nast. Great shot of a model. And uh, as it's spread around on social media, uh, I don't know who D. Andre Michael is, might be the photographer here, but there's a post featured in this Quartz piece uh, where it's really all about the cover and appreciating the cover. And in there, we've got hashtag captured on Google Pixel 3, along with a slew of other hashtags. And uh, nothing, by the way, hashtag spawn or partnership or promotion or disclosure or anything else like that. And what you learn when you um, dig into the relationship between Google and Condé Nast is Condé Nast says, oh yes, we disclose this relationship when we have things like this Allure cover, but it's inside the magazine and I'm sure buried in fine print somewhere in the masthead. Um, So uh, that's what I assume anyway. And uh, the question then becomes, you know, it's very clear from the FTC that when you have scenarios like this, you have to disclose them. You have to be very straightforward in how you disclose them, that you have to prominently disclose them. And, You know, this seems like it may be running afoul of those requirements. There's a good post on fashion law, fashion law about um, all of the legal ramifications of this. Uh, What do you think about this uh, Google partnering in the print world spilling over into the social media arena and triggering FTC requirements, Stefan? You know, when you watch. uh, videotape sometimes from live events and they blur out brands that haven't paid to have their brand displayed, um, mm-hmm. you know, covering it up. I, it, it's funny to think about like, what would you cover up in this instance where, where the camera being used, uh, is taking the, the picture, you, you know, you would have to just blur out the whole cover. Um, if this were being displayed within, within a shot of, of something that needed to be blurred out. The, um, you know, the, to me, it just kind of seems like, as an ordinary reader, I'm looking at the ad right now on my computer, which is why I'm looking away from the screen. If I saw the Pixel 3 hashtag under a picture like this, 
I would I would immediately assume that Pixel Three or the whatever the camera is called is is involved as a marketing partner. I I think most people tend to assume that anything you see in a magazine where there's a brand being mentioned, it's not serendipity. So I have a hard mm-hmm. time seeing the kind of argument that this is misleading somehow. You would have to be pretty unsophisticated to just think, oh, these nice people at Condé Nast are doing Google a favor by <laughs> promoting their products. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think Maybe- uh, where it gets complicated is as this gets spread around social media, you know, I don't, I don't know who, again, this... Uh, person in this particular post was, but they might not, there's nothing that says that somebody spreading this around and using this hashtag has to be affiliated with Condé Nast in any way. And if they're not, then your radar of, oh, I'm being marketed to here uh, might not be triggered as sensitively. Um, so I, I do think uh, that it's it's a pretty interesting and nuanced situation here. Um, The FTC requires that disclosures of material connection must be clear and conspicuous. Uh, And explaining something like that in a footnote behind an obscure link or on a general page, uh, certainly divorced from the cover here that we're talking about, uh, is not going to be sufficient. Uh, The FTC says with any disclosure of material information, businesses should put the disclosure in a location where consumers will see it and read it. And I just don't feel like the FTC is going to cut folks a lot of slack in a way that would make this particular arrangement okay. Um, so uh, as I said, interesting uh, further deep dive on this at Fashion Law if you're interested in more information. Uh, with that, let's look at some stories related to crimes and justice. Boy, a bunch of people sent me this story wanting to make sure that we knew it was going on out there uh, because we have another example we've talked about, you know, every time we've heard of an example like this, uh, we've talked about it on the show. Uh, The most uh, famous prior one, I think, involved a murder case in Arkansas. Uh, Here we have a local judge in New Hampshire ordering Amazon to turn over two days worth of echo recordings uh, from an an echo device that they seized uh, related to um, two women who were murdered there. Uh, The suspect is named Timothy Verrill. He will stand trial in May of next year. He has pleaded not guilty. So the government is building its case against him and they think they might find something relevant Uh, that was recorded by the Echo. Now, we know that these devices uh, respond to wake words. And according to both technologists that have examined the devices and Amazon itself, uh, they're not on all the time recording everything that happens in the room. But there have been interesting uh, anecdotal instances where the device has been turned on and triggered and started recording and taking action when no one thought that it might. (laughs) It thought it heard a wake word and was therefore activated. So uh, you you can't fault law enforcement for trying to see if there's anything uh, that would help them in building their case and and you know obviously they would have to share that information with the defense as well and there who knows there could be something on there that would help the defense in defending the murder charges as well but the interesting piece here is what is amazon to do as more and more of these requests come through well for the time being amazon has not complied And for the time being, it looks as though there has not been any court order directing Amazon to comply. But my assumption is that once there is such an order, Amazon would comply and give over whatever it had. Um, So interesting uh, IOT development there for evidence in criminal actions. Uh, In the Washington Post story on this interesting statistic, 
uh, research firm Gartner predicts there will be 20.4 billion IoT devices in people's homes and on their people, on their persons by 2020. Uh, that's up from the 11.2 billion connected devices Gartner forecasts will be in use this year. Stefan, any thoughts on uh, Alexa and criminal evidence? Regardless of which company is making the device, I understand that they're going to be in a lot of um, pressure to kind of maintain uh, their users' privacy because if if the word gets out that they're just sort of handing this data over uh, without binding court orders, that's going to be really bad for business. So I understand their perspective and their reluctance. What I the distinction I would make between something like this and some of the other other privacy stories that we hear about uh, is in this particular case, there's been a crime. Uh, there's been a, some motion practice, and it appears that actually there is a court order in one of these cases here, um, and it just hasn't been served yet. Mm -hmm. And so you, you have this transparent public process that's going on where everybody's aware of what's going on. And I, I see that as very different from some of the other privacy issues that happen where data is being collected uh, and sort of packaged and sold without people's uh, in knowledge or consent and without any kind of... Um, or maybe not, I shouldn't say without knowledge or consent, but without any kind of active, uh, particularized consent as to the particular piece of data that's being sent. It's just more of this like aggregate thing that's happening all the time. I, I see it as a very different issue because here you can have a public debate, you can have a clear goal and a clear limit on what's gets shared and why it's being shared. And so I see this as being actually kind of a healthy process and I hope some good norms and laws ar arise around it because fundamentally if you're going through the court system, uh, it's in the public domain, and so you, you'll know about it, and and you can have a debate about it. I'm much more worried about stuff that's happening uh, behind behind sort of closed doors where nobody really knows what's happening. That to me is a much more salient um, policy question. Yeah, and Nate Cardozo of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who's been on our show before, uh, points out this is not necessarily something new under the sun. Uh, he told the Washington Post that law enforcement has long asked technology companies to turn over data from connected devices. Uh, he says such requests date back to at least the early 2000s when law enforcement tried to surveil car, uh, surveil via car assistance programs. Uh, the telematics in your car, I would, I would suspect he's referring to there. Uh, but it's happening with far greater frequency as the number of IoT devices in people's homes explode. So, um, you know, we're seeing more and more of this uh, happening and I expect that that will, that trend will just continue. Um, another interesting thing, speaking of the EFF, going on here in California. If you live here in California, and even if you didn't, if you don't, you may have heard uh, that one of the laws newly enacted in the state, um, it's not uh, slated to take effect until October of next year, but it's something that our governor just signed into law, I think back in September, um, has to do with our bail system. Uh, in the criminal justice system, that we're not going to have a cash bail system anymore in the state where you go to a bail bonds person or you um, put up bail yourself and you uh, maybe you're eligible for bail and you get to be out on bail while you're awaiting trial. Now, uh, the state's criminal justice system uh, is going to replace cash bail uh, with an algorithmic pretrial risk assessment. So if you heard the news about California doing away with cash bail, you might not have realized that what was going to replace it is not the what we've had all along is you know a jurist uh, taking evidence and making an assessment about whether the person person is a flight risk or not, the extent to which that is the case. Uh, but instead, it's going to fall to private entities who make algorithmic pretrial risk assessment programs for use by the courts to come up with algorithms that can do this in a way that's fair and accurate and that we all feel serves justice. Uh, EFF is concerned about the algorithms available being ready for prime time in this regard. And as I said, we've got less than a year before 
uh, this is going to be the way that things function in the California judicial system. So uh, EFF has also uh, helpfully given lawmakers and uh, hopefully the companies uh, that are hoping to jump into this market and supply those tools uh, some tips on how a good tool like that should function and the pitfalls that it would be subjected to uh, in the ways of, you know, you might have had biases in the jurists making these uh, determinations before, but how the algorithm gets programmed is subject to bias as well. So uh, we need to be confident that if we're gonna be uh, outsourcing this kind of task to an algorithm, um, that its fairnesses and biases are transparently examined and exposed and that people feel good about that before it's implemented. So good piece at EFF. Um, about the ramifications of all of this, but it is coming down the pipe. Uh, bail in California, uh, this is the plan for it by October of next year. So what do you think of this, Stefan? This sounds positively dystopian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, not to say that a cash bail system is any better, but the um, the question I have, and I don't, I don't know the answer, so I'm sort of literally asking the question: Is what public oversight is there going to be in, in the coding of, of the algorithm? I mean, do you have an ability as a as a someone who lives in California to to look at it, to analyze the source code, and, and have sort of a crowdsourced approach that says, "Wait a minute, this is completely ridiculous. The, the way that this algorithm is running has X, Y, Z consequence. Um, if you made the following tweak, you could improve it." I mean, I could see. It being um, something that if, if it were publicly uh, accessible and everybody could look at it and analyze and provide feedback and sort of adjust it um, in, in, in real time, you might get to an equitable point where you would have trust in the system. If it's something that's guarded and, and nobody can really access or comment on or change, I, I don't know how you get good results with something like this because all, there are so many assumptions that need to go into what constitutes a risk um, and... and uh, it's just, I don't know how you do that in an equitable way without a prolonged period of public comment and scrutiny. Yeah, well, I, I think you raise a really good point. And I think that people like the EFF will be ready to jump in and challenge decisions uh, and processes if they uh, fail to meet standards of fairness and constitutionality. constitutionality. Um, and and that we definitely can look for more to come on that front because even though uh, EFF has helpfully said here's here's what we must consider and here's how these systems should work, um, I I don't hold out a lot of hope that those sorts of guidelines will lead to a perfect algorithmic uh, bail determination system. I uh, you know hope springs eternal I guess, but um, experience tells me that that we're going to see problems uh, with this new system. So. Um, I also think that we're going to see those problems aired in the court system and that probably the um, lawmakers did not, you know, think a lot about how we're going to make sure that this is an ironclad system uh, before it gets implemented. So um, uh, I think you raise great points, but uh, that uh, we're, we're looking at controversy about this as it gets implemented down the road. Uh, let's see, along those lines, where did I lost my criminal justice stories here? Um, oh, we've got uh, an interesting development in uh, using online tools to um, attack people in the physical world here involving a murder. Uh, you'll remember that uh, quite some time ago, we discussed, and I think we've discussed several times on the show, uh, the Twitter attack by John Rain Ravello, who's someone who resides in Texas, uh, against the journalist Kurt Eichenwald, who was an epileptic. And uh, John Rain Ravello was arrested and charged for sending a tweet, a strobing tweet that was designed to trigger an epileptic fit in journalist Kurt Eichenwald. Um, the federal charges on that were dropped, uh, but uh, Eichenwald's uh, civil lawsuit and I assume various state criminal charges are still moving forward in Texas. So uh, against that backdrop, 
What we have now is um, an actual death from a swatting attack. Uh, someone in Kansas was actually killed as the result of an online vendetta. And it, I, I'm hoping everyone knows by now uh, what swatting is. Uh, and I'd sort of hoped we'd seen the last of it. It seemed to be something that was getting a lot of press and um, sort of spotlight on it. Uh, but the notion is you would um, call the police, uh, lead the police or you know the SWAT team to believe that something awful was happening happening at someone's address when that was not in fact the case, and that your your goal is just to have them be. Um, plagued and terrified by having a SWAT team show up at their house. And in this particular instance, uh, someone actually died as the result of making a false report uh, to the police. So um, the person's now being uh, charged with murder and has pled guilty to murder in, in that attack. So. Um, uh, in, another interesting example of how people's online activities uh, can do, f can commit physical, terrible here, you know, the worst possible crime. Uh, he's charged with murder uh, in the real world. Uh, any thoughts on this, Stefan? It, it seems like the right result. I mean, what a horrible thing to do to somebody. The, mm -hmm. the, um, the problem could on, on some level be that people haven't yet gotten used to thinking about the real world applica uh, implications of what they do online. Um, mm -hmm. I doubt that this is going to stop people from being complete jerks online. I think we're going to still see a lot of bad behavior. But having these instances where bad online behavior has, has genuine consequences and punishment associated with it could maybe train people to think a little bit more about what they're doing online and how it affects uh, the real world. I think... It's just, I mean, what a, it's horrible. I mean, <laughs> yeah. between that and, and doxing and every other terrible behavior we see uh, people engage in on some of these forums, it's just, it's reassuring to see an instance where someone who was responsible for something that's horrible is punished for it. Right, and law, law enforcement certainly doesn't seem to be slowed down at all by the fact that um, here, you know, the murder wasn't directly committed by the person, but, but as a result of um, what bad decisions they decided to make. Um, also relevant to things we discuss a lot here on This Week in Law, the same person also pled guilty to, he called, in addition to calling the SWAT team falsely on the person who died, 28-year-old uh, Andrew Finch is the um, person who uh, is accused of having done this and has pled guilty. Um, uh, he also called in numerous fake bomb scares against schools, universities, shopping malls, and the headquarters of the FBI and the FCC during the FCC vote on net neutrality. Um, so uh, it's it's good to see law enforcement um, taking those kind of, certainly you call in a bomb threat. I don't think anybody would be surprised to see law enforcement happy to uh, and aggressively prosecuting charges for that, it's it's the swatting thing that I think is um, an interesting sort of successor to what we were talking about with uh, Kurt Eichenwald and, and the fact that he was held accountable for his actions there too. Uh, any final thoughts on this before we move on, Stefan? I think everyone should be nice. I do too, totally agree. Be nice. So uh, one way that people are, are trying to be nice and trying to help law enforcement, but we can talk about um, the ramifications of this. Uh, listener David tipped me off to the fact that, um, and I'm, I'm sure this is probably happening in more counties than just Cobb County, Georgia. But uh, it happened to have caught his eye that Cobb County, Georgia, wants to partner up with its citizenry who uh, increasingly, we're talking about all the internet connected, Internet of Things devices in use everywhere. Uh, and one of those common kinds of devices that people have is the security camera on their house, which is not only you know surveilling their yard and helping keep it uh, safe and help people know what's going on in their home or outside their home, uh, but they're taking in a lot of what's going on in the environment and what uh, the Cobb County, is it the Sheriff's Department or the Police Department? I think it's the Police Department. Um, 
they have given people a way where they can voluntarily register their security camera. Uh, and what happens there, the public information officer for the police department says, is if we have a crime that happens in a particular spot, we can pull up and map and go right to where this person has their camera registered. Uh, we'll knock on their door and give them or give them a call and ask, do you by any chance have footage of this day at this time? Um, so homeowners are into the idea. The police uh, obviously um, like to have more eyes and ears that can help them uh, detect and deter crime. Uh, but I, I think listener David sent us this story uh, wondering about the sort of surveillance everywhere atmosphere that this begins to create. And uh, again, this is not the police hacking into anybody's <laughs> security cameras or using them without their uh, permission or knowledge or in any way clandestinely, uh, but this is people volunteering to put their cameras to work for the police. What do you think about that, Stefan? I, I understand why people are uncomfortable with this. I'll, I'll point out that the alternative to having a public agency involved is just letting people aggregate this data privately and essentially having this parallel structure where you're doing all the same surveillance, but it's in, a, in the hands of, of a private company with no public uh, accountability to it. And w one of the things that always strikes me in, in these privacy discussions is as soon as you mention the government having access to something, people get very uncomfortable because of all the uh, implications that they associate with that. But if the exact same behavior is happening and it's not subject to the same scrutiny and the same standards as, as, be, uh, as behavior that is being uh, monitored by a government agency, your privacy uh, result isn't necessarily any better. It's just subject to less scrutiny. And so it, if the alternative to this is having a private company control surveillance data and disseminate it however it wants, that's not necessarily a better uh, result. And so um, I guess what I'll say is um, obviously there are real policy concerns with having uh, police tap into people's uh, home cameras and, and gather that data. But at least they're being transparent about it, and uh, at least if something goes wrong, they're going to be held to the standards that you would expect the public agency to be uh, held to. Yeah, uh, it's really just more of a, uh, you know, this is happening and pay attention kind of uh, response here. Uh, I think we're going to do one last uh, group of stories or just one last story here in the realm of uh, robots and the Internet of Things, which we've kind of been talking about a lot today. So uh, the killer robots are indeed coming. And as uh, countries try and uh, wrestle through the tough issues of how to regulate uh, artificially intelligent military applications of robots, uh, private enterprise, and actually the folks protecting the Great Barrier Reef in Australia are taking the plunge into killer robots, regardless of what various <laughs> international treaties may ultimately provide. Uh, there are starfish on the Great Barrier Reef. I have seen these in person before, not in Australia, but I've seen them elsewhere. Uh, they are called crown of thorns starfish and they eat coral. And if uh, their populations get out of control, they can do a lot of damage to the coral. And that seems to be what is happening at the Great Barrier Reef. And so the solution, as reported over by Ashley Braun in a piece at Medium uh, in its environment section, is that uh, robots are being developed to go out and target the um, overpopulation of crown of thorns starfish and take them out so that we can protect the coral. Um, all I can say about this is 
I'm terrified of the killer robots patrolling the reef. As someone who does a fair amount of scuba diving, uh, I actually uh, enjoy crown of thorns and starfish, but I can understand how if their populations were out of control and damaging coral, we'd have to do something about them. Uh, what else? I also think the lionfish in the Caribbean, who are another um, invasive and out of control species doing harm to the um, underwater ecosystems there, must be quaking in their little lionfish boots, knowing that uh, killer robots are being developed to patrol the reef. Any thoughts on this, Stefan? It's nice to see a killer robot story that has kind of a, a positive spin to it. it. You know, we always hear about killer robots in this very demonized way. And mm -hmm. this is a nice, you know, killer robots as uh, instruments of environmental protection. It's got a nice kind of <laughs> fanciful uh, ring to it that I that I like. I, you know, it. I'm not sure if the company doing this is private. Again, this goes back to my general concern of if you have private companies making killer robots, even if they're doing it for a good reason, uh, maybe we should have some regulatory oversight and ensure that they're doing this in a way that's going to be a net gain and, and not sort of the first step in beta testing an army of killer robots that has applications beyond crown of thorn starfish, uh, which mm -hmm. it obviously will. So um, I I tend to be on the side of cautiously optimistic about technological progress as long as being kind of pulled back in the right direction. And obviously, as soon as you start talking about uh, killer robots, there, there's a lot of concern there. So, Right. The uh, thing is called a ranger bot uh, developed by roboticists from Queensland University of Technology. Um, and they the idea for it dates back to 2005. Uh, and so, uh, if you're planning your next dive trip down to Australia, definitely keep an eye posted for these black and yellow robots who, um, hopefully don't have you in their sights. <laughs> I don't mean to drum up, a, a false concern or fear of the starfish targeting robots. I think they'd probably have a hard time confusing you, but, uh, uh, and, and you'd probably be hard pressed to find one. Hopefully they're few and far between down there doing their job. Um, let us move on to our animal selfie of the week. We brought an old friend back for our animal selfie this week in episode 443 of This Week in Law. This is Manny the selfie cat. Manny is a cat who has learned how to activate a GoPro and does it with great glee on Manny's own Instagram uh, channel page. Um, anyway, uh, Manny is preparing for winter. And so uh, as are we all. So I thought we'd just give you this nice uh, winter view of Manny the selfie cat continuing in his selfie taking exploits. Now, Manny is an animal that that definitely um, squarely gets what an animal selfie is. There is no human involved in taking this photo, except to the extent that Manny has been provided with the mechanism of photographing himself. And uh, I, I wonder what Manny thinks is happening when Manny uh, clicks the shutter on these things, or if Manny has been trained that he gets a treat when he does so. In any event, he's definitely taking his own picture and does so. Uh, at volume over on Instagram on uh, his account there. Uh, our tip of the week is looking forward to the holidays. There is um, a really nice piece at Wired talking about safely and securely disposing of and maybe finding an alternative use for your old gadgets. Uh, if you think that there might be a Google Pixel 3 coming into your life because of its lovely camera as uh, partnered up with Condé Nast, or uh, just, you know, it tends to be a time for a device turnover of all sorts um, in the holiday season. Uh, and uh, to make sure, there are a couple of concerns about that, right? You don't want um, all of this uh, electronic waste to continue cluttering up the planet. And you certainly don't want all your data to be cluttering up uh, bad actors' 
hard drives uh, who can come after you and do bad things. So um, the nice thing about this piece at Wired by David Neald over there uh, goes through the way that you wipe your device on many different kinds of platforms. So if you can just find whatever device it is that you are either getting rid of, uh, hopefully recycling if you're getting rid of it or repurposing, uh, then it, odds are that you're gonna find some good instructions on how to do it here in this piece, no matter what your device is. And uh, then as I alluded to, uh, David spent some time talking about recycling the device or you know, how, helping you think through, well, I don't need this thing as a phone anymore. Maybe what else could it do or who could use it in what different way um, so that it doesn't have to end its useful life as a gadget just yet. So uh, go check out that piece at Wired. Uh, our tip is to uh, wipe and recycle uh, as much as you can if you're getting rid of devices this holiday season. And then I have a few resources to mention. Uh, one is it caught my eye that EFF's uh, email newsletter which has been around since 1990 of all things. It's called Effector and all of its archives are online. So if you are interested in researching some of the trends that we've been talking about on this show uh, since the mid 2000s and going back even further than that, uh, the Effector might be a great resource for you. And uh, just really interesting, I would think, to go um, back into the archives. And of course, to subscribe to uh, as they go forward. It's always a great, um, uh, both informational and entertaining thing to arrive in your inbox. So one resource is the Effector. Uh, yet another resource comes from the good people at Mozilla, who, again, looking forward to the holidays, have produced a ranking of 70 items that you might be tempted to bring into your life or give into somebody else's life during the holiday season. And they have ranked these items based on, guess what, creepiness and security. Uh, so they've developed a great criteria for um, figuring out what the device knows about you. Can you control it? Uh, how, how do you manage the data, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the neat thing about having done this list is uh, if there are devices that are failing Mozilla's criteria and being ranked fairly creepy or very creepy, uh, that, you know, it gives the device makers a heads up that maybe they could be doing a better job and um, they will hopefully take more measures to decreepify the devices that uh, you may want to incorporate into your life or um, have somebody else do so. And then just as a final resource for the show, we can't really uh, do a show during this week, November 16th of 2018, without uh, noting and having you note that this has been a very interesting week for Facebook, uh, that there was a pretty um, controversial a uh, very deeply researched New York Times story about Facebook that's titled Delay, Deny and Deflect, How Facebook's Leaders Fought Through Crisis, broke, I believe, two days ago now by uh, Shira Frankel, Nicholas Confessore, Cecilia Kang, Matt Rosenberg, and Jack Nickus at the New York Times. And it is making some serious waves. Uh, I guess the resource, in addition to the article itself, I listened to uh, the New York Times daily podcast today, which had Nick Confessore and uh, I believe who else was on it? Uh, Shira, I believe his co-author, co-reporter Shira was also on the podcast. And uh, they go into detail on um, so if you're someone who consumes information more readily, and you might be since you're listening to our show in audio form, they really summarize and unpack and give some background about, about the article itself. And at one point, Nick Confessore 
uh, calls this Facebook's Upton Sinclair moment, where people are really uh, learning or thinking that they're learning about how the sausage is getting made and and that there are concerns uh, both among the general public and among lawmakers about what's going on there. And specifically, we see a couple of different lawmakers chiming in and saying, uh, we, we see some room to get involved here. Uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar uh, has mentioned that uh, campaign finance violations might be triggered by some of the conduct destri- described here. And then we have uh, David Sicheline, if I'm saying his name correctly, He is a ranking member on the House Antitrust Subcommittee, and he came out, I believe, just yesterday, and his opinion is Facebook cannot be trusted to regulate itself uh, based on what he's now learned from um, the reporting of the New York Times. Uh, And he thinks that uh, the House Antitrust Subcommittee should be taking a a closer look at um, what it can do on the antitrust front uh, to um, address what they've learned in this reporting. So um, interesting fallout uh, from the New York Times report on the legal front for Facebook. And again, we'll just have to um, stay tuned and see if lawmakers pursue this further. But I, I did think that it was um, interesting to consider this in terms of Upton Sinclair and and learning things about internal practices that um, the general public might not be happy with. So um, with that, I think we will go ahead and wrap up this episode of This Week in Law and wish you a an extraordinarily happy and safe and peaceful and family filmed, uh, filmed, <laughs> yes, everything's filmed these days, <laughs> family filled American Thanksgiving next week. We will be off next week, but uh, back at it after that. It's been great to be here with you this week as always and wonderful chatting with you, Stefan. Thanks, Denise. You caught me in the middle of expert discovery. So if I'm a little dazed, that's why, but always fun to be on here and fun to get ready for um, American Thanksgiving as as you so kindly called it for me. <laughs> and uh, yes, I, I'm afraid I just blipped right over Canadian Thanksgiving. Uh, is Cana- does Canadian Thanksgiving have traditional food that we should know about? The way I always describe Canadian Thanksgiving is that it's a lot mm-hmm. like American Thanksgiving, but downshifted because most people don't really care about it all that much. So you get the same kinds of food, but it's a much less prominently featured holiday. And so some people take it seriously, some people don't. I really fell in love with uh, Thanksgiving when I moved to the U.S. And, and um, I just think it's a great holiday because it just seems to have a lot less, I don't know, it's somehow less commercialized than all the other ones and people take it seriously. And it's just a nice, fun time. And um I uh, I really like the holiday, so I'm glad glad to be able to look forward to it next week. Yeah, I love how people you know put the brakes on on the busy things like expert discovery in their lives and um, <laughs> take some time yeah. to to spend time with family and hopefully don't scream and yell at each other when they disagree politically. Maybe we can uh, all look for a more um, friendly kind of Thanksgiving with our loved ones this year. I certainly hope so and intend to uh, try and adhere to that in my own life. Um, So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. If you've done so on a Friday, you've probably tuned in at 11 o'clock Pacific time, 1900 UTC at this time of year is when we record the show live every week, uh, except for As I said, next week we'll be off for the holiday. Uh, So that's a great time to go to twit.tv and join us live if you can, if it fits into your schedule on a Friday. If not, head on over to twit.tv slash twill. And like the effector, we are posting our shows week in, week out, and uh, having them there for your consumption at your leisure. Uh, You can go back and find things on particular topics uh, at a particular time frame, try and sort of uh, grasp the zeitgeist of what was going on at the intersection of law and technology um, as we've gone back in time. There's also instructions there for how you might want to enjoy the show. Maybe there are ways that you hadn't thought about watching the show that uh, or listening to the show. And if you go over there, um, perhaps you will be inspired. We are just thrilled that you join us 
however and whenever you do. I'm going to put our last final uh, this, uh, sorry, uh, MCLE passphrase into the show right here and right now. And it's going to be killer robots for killer starfish. So jot that down if you are listening for uh, credit in your professional field. Uh, and with that, I think we will sign off and wish you a happy turkey, get, turkey day. We'll see you uh, at the end of the month. Until then, take that, take care. And please take care with your enunciation, which I am having problems with at this moment. Love you all. See you soon.